hopefully everybody is uh, here for this topic because that's what we're going to talk about uh, the importance of wireless security policy uh, about me jim did a good enough job introducing me um so we'll move on so talking about wireless security policy um I, I like doing this exercise and I like putting it at the beginning of slideshow sometimes. It's, you know, in some ways not all that meaningful and it and in another way it's very meaningful. So if I just Google wireless network security policy, you see that there's 366 million results. Um, again, you know, not a lot of contacts. You'd have to figure out, you'd have to go through those results and, you know, see what see what they are and what they amount to but just the fact that there's that many hits on that search uh, to me has some meaning especially for a discussion like this wireless security policy is one of those you know non uh not not immediately technical or not directly technical aspects of many of our jobs it's also one of those things that a lot of people ought to be worrying about everybody from your CTO and your CIO, your security officers. You know, if policy isn't written well and isn't implemented well, um, you could find uh, organizational problems that come back and bite you in really, really bad ways. You know, if this is something you're not thorough about. For those of us who do system administration and system configuration, you know, if you don't have something that you're aiming for, if you don't have a target, you know, gonna find that you're kind of making stuff up. Um, you know, we're gonna talk about all of this more, but you know, even the end users, you know, they certainly have a hand in wireless uh, security policy. If you're in the corporate world, people need to know what they can and can't do. And if they're a user, you know, out in a, at a conference center or whatever, even though the rules are a lot less, uh, stringent there still are generally rules and expectations and you know things you can and can't do it, you know <laughs> often violated in those settings but uh, still um, policy is pretty uh, important globally so kind of a rhetorical question only big environments need policy right it's like no um really anybody who's operating a wireless network more so on the corporate side of life and when i say corporate you know we're, we're down even to smbs you know a small florist shop that has a router that only the employees use kind of thing um but what if the employees give out the password you know everything even to me, even at home, um, everything um, runs on wireless anymore. Really, even if it's not a formal policy, if you think about it, you know, I want to know when somebody who visits my home has been given the password. I end up changing the password uh, periodically, you know, kind of as a matter of good practice. And um, so you've got the, you know, the informal approach, and then you've got more of what we're going to be talking about the structured uh, policy stuff that we'll get to in a little bit but bottom line is if you're doing wireless you better have some kind of security policy in place and again kind of rhetorical well gee why do we need policy um you know we're going to talk about some of the textbook stuff but just kind of boil it down to common sense Good policy will keep your wireless network healthy. Your clients, you know, need to be kept on the straight and narrow by knowing what they can and can't do, you know, by your operational rules. Um, obviously, as everything heads to the wireless network, and that's where access becomes most prevalent to the network, um, sensitive information is going to be out there. And granted, wireless security policy isn't the end all for protecting sensitive information, but it certainly has a hand in it. And by the way, that is another uh, fallacy, another mistake that people make out there is kind of overemphasizing, you know, what you can do at layer two and uh, such with wireless. And, you know, 
I've got 802.1x, I'm done. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. Um, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit too, but um, when you go shopping for solutions, you know, a lot of times policy is your metric. You know, I'm looking for a solution that can do such and such, and it has to basically help us enforce our policy. Can it? Well, no, it can't do these one or two things. So um, I guess we won't be buying it. And then also, you know, policy can keep the environment in good shape. You know, when I say eliminate potential issues, you know, there's only so much stuff that's supposed to be in the environment and, you know, keep things that are not supposed to be in it from being introduced and creating problems. So, you know, probably no news when you look at this bulleted list, but at the same time, um, it is good to pause and say, you know, why is this a big deal? And it's kind of common sense, but it's one of those things that's um, so common sense, it's easy to forget about why you're doing it and it becomes just one more thing. Oh yeah, we got policy, it's in a binder, it's in the back room, haven't looked at it in a decade, yeah, but we got it. But it is important to, to think about why you're doing what you're doing. So follow that up with, you know, what if we just run without policy? The, the picture on the right of the slide, um, you know, feel bad for the people who were probably on that train, but you also don't want your wireless network to be that train because you choose to run with a, without policy. You own the chaos. Yeah, I, I call it a game with no rules. So how does anybody play it? You know, if you haven't taken the time and developed the policy, what are you enforcing? How does anybody know what they can and can't do? You know, how do you keep the, basically how do you keep the thing on the rails? The second to, uh, second to last bullet there in this day and age is pretty important. The reputational damage thing. Um, you know, we're kind of in an age where CIOs and CTOs get canned if something happens that rises to the, you know, the right level. And, you know, it's a, you know, embarrassment in the media and such. Um, I know I like my management uh, chain, the people who I work for, and uh, boy, the last thing I would want to be part of is any of those uh, men and women, um, you know, running into trouble because I did something uh, bad related to policy. So, you know, it, it's just not good to run without policy, bottom line. Right, and then, you know, there's the regulatory stuff. If you're familiar with any of these, it's kind of a no-brainer. You know, HIPAA, uh, my wife is, works in the medical realm. Uh, HIPAA is huge. Even in my uh, university role, we have a small medical center and there are, there are HIPAA things we have to do. Um, anybody who's doing retail, PCI comes up, you know, the banking industry and finance, um, you know, financials have their own things that they have to do to meet regulatory compliance. And then uh, a lot of those are kind of more mainstream, but wireless is huge, everybody's doing it. So uh, national security and, you know, DOD military, I'm gonna give you one example of a, a policy if you get curious about looking up how one of these agencies approaches it, you know, in just a little bit, but um, there are things that you have some flexibility in doing when you come up with a policy and there are other things that boy if you don't do it right um you know again by regulation you're going to find yourself in trouble you're going to find your organization in trouble and the stakes only get higher as more and more stuff moves the wireless So I define the following aspects of a of an effective wireless security policy because there are a lot of them that are ineffective. So the operating word here um, is effective. Um, starts with the top bullet, and that was in the trivia question. That that whole notion of executive buy-in sounds very buzzwordy, right? Well, I can come up with the most elegant. Uh, policy in the world, the most comprehensive policy, the most well thought out, you know, I go the extra mile and I, 
I walked that fine line between ease of use for my users and organizational security. And I put together this grand plan of wireless security that just should be the, the, you know, the holy grail. Well, if my higher ups don't buy into it and they don't help back me up when it's time to enforce, or they don't really give a rip when there's violations and people aren't held accountable or worse, they're violating it in front of everybody and you know, do as I say, not as I do kind of stuff. If you don't have executive buy-in, um, your wireless security policy, you're gonna have trouble. And this is where it's worth pausing and saying, remove the word wireless. If you don't have executive buy-in for your security policy, period, um, you've got trouble. Wireless is, is a subset of the bigger network picture. And we don't want to lose sight of that, but you know we are talking about wireless here today. So just you know, you gotta have the big cheeses buying into it. Policy really needs to be clearly worded. You know, we work in an industry that is so laden with jargon, and a lot of times you can't escape the jargon, um, even when you're talking to the you know the common people. But at the same time, you got to do your best to make it something that can be understood. Once you've conquered that, you have to figure out a way to communicate it. It's really not just enough to say, you know, like I said before, it's in a binder on the back shelf in my office. And, you know, how are people supposed to find it? You know, to me, a well communicated policy, you know, that's part of like employee onboarding, uh, it's part of a, you know, the initial use of the network. Again, we're not talking about public hotspots or, or that kind of thing. We're talking about, you know, more businessy application here, but um, as people on board or as vendors come in that are gonna use the network or whatever, anybody who's going to be on the network short of wide open gas, they need to, you know, not only know that policy exists, but it, but also acknowledge that they are going to be held accountable um, for following it. Like I said before, you need to be able to enforce it and it needs to be enforceable. Um, you know, you don't want to word it in such a way where it's just lunacy, you know. Um, one of those might be, you know, we are the, you know, we trump the FCC, we have total say over everything, don't do anything without checking with us. You know, that that's going to be not particularly enforceable. Um, so you got to live in the real world and you do have to enforce it where people are um, violating your policy. It needs to be corrected or it just, you know, kind of falls apart and becomes meaningless. The notion of exceptions can be challenging. My mind goes to the fact that, um, you know, the, the, uh, consumer wireless space, the consumer gadget space is just growing and growing while the enterprise, um, you know, infrastructure systems still are not particularly flexible. There's a big gap between the security approach of the consumer side and the enterprise side. And every now and then somebody is gonna to come to you and say either I want to, or I am going to use this thing that right out of the box violates policy. And guess what? You're gonna help me do it. And you know, there are, there are times where you're not gonna have a lot of say in it. Um, so it is good to have and it's this, you know, coming from a place where a lot of research is done. Um, you want to have in place a documented mechanism for, you know, for how we handle exceptions. Um, you know, you don't have to say yes to everything, but some things that you would normally or prefer to say no to, um, you may not be able to every time. So that notion of being able to accommodate exceptions uh, gracefully and consistently is pretty important. Any policy um, needs to be reviewed periodically it needs to be updated as things change. You know, if you wrote a policy, you know, five, eight years ago, whatever, and now we're in the age of WPA3 and, you know, there's a new, all kinds of new IOT devices and all of that. You might find that your policy that you wrote a long time ago that's been serving you faithfully 
<clears throat> just doesn't cut it for today. So, you know, it's one of those things where um, scheduled periodic review is pretty good. You know, whether you do it every 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, whatever, pick an interval and schedule it, have it come up as a work order, have it come up on somebody's calendar. But the periodic review thing is pretty important. And then, as I mentioned, wireless is really just a subset of the bigger network. The bigger network is going to be bound by all kinds of policies, um, ideally, if you've done it right. And the last thing you want to do is go to your wireless guy or gal and say, hey, wireless expert, write me up a policy without that person having any knowledge of what the other policies are. Now you've got you know a whole bunch of one-offs. The you know, things that don't jive with each other, things that don't line up, you know, silos writing policies that exclude what the other parts of the network and organization are doing. It has to be, we've got a, we've got a moaning dog here, excuse me, <laughs> bug dog who's yelling at me. Um, everything has to line up organizationally. You know, that, that's just kind of common sense. If the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing, whether it be operationally or for something like policy, it's going to show up sooner or later in the form of problems. So boil it down to if your operations don't align with your policy, something's drastically wrong. Um, and sometimes it happens and it's not pretty. You know, you have a one example is, you know, you find that all of a sudden a vendor is doing any darn thing he wants because somebody enabled that vendor to do any darn thing they want and it is totally at odds with your policy and you don't find out until whatever that activity is is so deeply rooted that untangling the mess um, is, is very difficult and hurts a lot of feelings and maybe even costs you money to, to rework what shouldn't have been done in the first place. So, you know, policy are words on paper or words on a web page, um, whatever. Solutions back up policy, right? So you you define the way your wireless network is going to work and what people can and can't do and the, the goals that the system um, needs to achieve. And then it's time to go shopping. And some of the examples of solutions that back up the um, wireless policy wireless security policies you know listed here uh, everything from rogue ap detection to your whips and your wids systems um, if you're in the pci world you know maybe you uh, invest in a system that can do its own pci audits um, unauthorized port usage is a big one you know part of the um, approach of nobody can plug in an access point or nobody can plug in a wireless router kind of thing um, might be port controls on the LAN side. So these are just examples of ways that you, you know, employ a solution to back up your policy. <clears throat> Down at the bottom there, we talk about solutions, um, you know, from a financial perspective, from a money angle solutions should make sense versus what they're protecting and monitoring you know spend too little spend too much you could either one is problematic you know back to my uh, florist uh, example you know i've got a i've got one wireless router in a small florist shop and you know two people ring up sales on their mobile devices wouldn't make a lot of sense to go crazy in there with some of the stuff that's in this list. At the same time, big environments with all kinds of security concerns, if they're not employing a lot of what's on this list, um, you know, they're gonna have they're gonna have issues as well. So it's all you know proportional, ideally it would be proportional um spend on wireless security for solutions to back up your policy. Some part of the challenge when you look at this list, I buy a wireless super system from any of Silicon Valley's finest and a lot of these things are gonna be included in the, in the heading of, yep, we do that natively, but they're not gonna all do it as good and they're probably, most of them are not going to do it as well as a third party who's 
solution has been designed just to do um, the thing that you need it most to do, like a whips or whatever kind of thing. Um, so a lot of food for thought there. I want to talk when we talk about the actual solutions that back up our policy. So the the uh, notion of writing policy, um, you know, first bullet there, it, it can utterly be miserable. Even if you're like a really good writer or you've got a brilliant wireless technical mind and you and you totally understand, you know, everything that you're up against, articulating it in a way, you know, to my previous bullet points there about, um, you know, needs to be easy to read and people need to be able be able to understand it. It can be pretty challenging uh, sausage to grind and then to make it fit in with all the other policies, um, you know, the ar arriving at a good effective wireless security policy <laughs> can be more challenging than you might think it should be. And if you've ever sat down to do it, you know exactly what I'm talking about, especially in a uh, bigger environment. Um, you know, the notion of collaborate, being collaborative uh, in bigger organizations goes to the fact that, you know, again, to say it for the third or fourth time, wireless just being part of the bigger network environment. Um, ideally, you're not tasked to do it without input or without you know, somebody else, um, I don't want to say proofreading, <clears throat> but somebody else making sure that what you're coming up with integrates well with the rest of policy um, and reads the same, you know, it's got the same approach in the verbiage, it's meeting the same goals where there is overlap. Um, it's that kind of uh, collaboration that, you know, is pretty uh, pivotal when you're writing policy. Thankfully, there are lots of examples uh, out there on the internet. A lot of people make their policies public, um, you know, not just wireless uh, network security, but also, you know, general security and um, land security. There's, there's a lot to pick from out there if you're totally clueless. Uh, a lot of times your if you go back to the regulatory, uh, you know, uh, aspects of all of this is like a first step. There are things that you're going to have to do as defined by PCI. There's things that you're going to have to do as defined by HIPAA. All right, so some of that will, much of that will point you in the right direction, but when it comes time to verbalize it and harmonize it with your operations and all of that and get it into a uh, written policy that you can live with, um, even though there's good examples, it's still got to be made to work in your own environment. And then I can't say it enough about the executive endorsement. If you if you just bypass that step, uh, you're going to be so screwed later on down the line. Um, it, it is just it cannot be ignored. So you know, hence the reason I'm harping on it and keep reintroducing it here in the discussion. Uh, same thing with communications. If I don't know about it. I can't abide by it. And if I know about it and I'm not held to some kind of uh, agreement or some kind of accountability that I will follow it, um, it's also not particularly going to be effective. So, <clears throat> documentation. There's no escape, especially when you're, uh, you know, responsible for actually. Um, running the network. It's one thing to be somebody who configures and all of that, but if you're in a management role, um, you know, this is a lot of this is going to resonate with you, or if you're not there yet, this is what you have to look forward to <laughs> from time to time. It's just comes with the territory. So I mentioned good examples and I mentioned, you know, the, the different um, worries of different agencies and all of that. Um, I didn't put a link on the page because you can't click on the link. Um, and it's kind of a easy one to go find. If you just look up USAID uh, as you see it and the wireless standards, this one is pretty um, interesting. There's a lot of government speak in this, but it's also a lot of uh, elements that any one of us would have in our own policy. 
So this one I like because it shows, you know, the everyday, uh, any generic wireless network kind of concerns, and it gets into a lot of the government specific stuff. And it's just a good example of a fairly complicated policy um, that somebody or a team of somebody's has managed to um, present pretty well and pretty, um, what's the word I'm looking for, pretty digestibly, um, fairly easy to read. And, you know, if I were to look at their policy and they were to say, you know, design me up a wireless network that not only does wireless, but meets these policy goals, the way they've written this, um, somebody who knows what they're doing um, would, would actually be able to translate their goals into a solution or a series of solutions that are all bolted together, bolted together to meet the need. So that one I like. Also not to pick on uh, UConn in any way, shape or form, but I'm putting this up there because um, higher ed is very generous with the sharing of their uh, policies. What's interesting here is if you go out and you look for, you know, do a search on uh, university uh, wireless network security policy, for example, as a search string, you're going to find um, a lot of a lot of us in higher ed because that's where I uh, am uh, generally. Um, very, very similar concerns, very similar policies, but there's also places where things diverge greatly. Like in my environment, for example, um, IT is very centralized and nobody is putting out any wireless unless it comes through my group first. And even then it really, um, you know, the, the answer is typically uh, no, we're not going to have competing systems. Let's figure out what your goals are and we'll we'll figure out how to get it there for you generally. Um, other schools take the approach of, well, every building can do whatever the heck they want. Every college can do whatever they want, every whatever. And it's far more decentralized and the, you know, the IT group just tries to herd cats and keep it all as um, you know, functional as it can be given the choice to be decentralized. But when you start picking through the policies and see who's doing what um, out there among higher ed, it's pretty thought provoking that you know, all of these schools can have basically the same educational mission and the same um, using the same bits and pieces, but um, interesting to see the similarities and the differences when it comes time for uh, policy and you know what's allowed to do what and or who's allowed to do what and a lot of that is shaped by not the people that are doing wireless who often get blamed for eh, your policy sucks I need to do blah 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 you got to remember where policy comes from it tends to come from sea level folks or be endorsed by sea level folks because it in it enforces their vision of campus operations. So um, a big data set to pick from uh, for policy examples and uh, who's doing what if you go out and you search for the higher ed um, policy examples. <clears throat> Losing my voice here, apologies. The, uh, the, the how to get started uh, doing policy or, you know, learning about policy kind of objectively and um, analytically and uh, what's, there's another word I'm looking for, scholarly, if you will. The CWSP uh, materials are a great place to start. The CWSP, the SP stands for security professional. Um, you can certainly, um, do the CWNA and then the CWSP and never advance any further in that program. And you'll do uh, really well for yourself. Or you can pursue the CWNE, and I'm not trying to do any marketing here, I'm just trying to give some context. And when you go all the way to CWNE, the um, Certified Wireless Network Expert, um, Jim and I both have that uh, certification, to get there, you have to do CWSP. And part of CWSP, you can see the current objectives on the slide, 
is learning about um, wireless LAN security requirements, um, you know, how they translate into policy, you get into how to write policies. It's just a good primer to get you going if you really don't know where to start. Even if, <clears throat> even if you just bought the book and read that chapter, um, if you're charged with doing anything with security policy, it, it's an exercise worth doing, <clears throat> having been there. And it's one of the books that I refer to from time to time um, when I have to go down this road and revisit changes to our own policies and all that. Just a good resource. So as we get to the end of my uh, narrative here, I'll let you know a little bit about the typical day in my policy life. And before uh, we can do that, I guess it's worth restating what my daily role is. Um, I'm kind of the the buck stops with me uh, in my university when it comes to things uh, regarding wireless. I obviously work for somebody. Um, my boss is the director of networking, um, wired wireless everything. He owns the entire network, but my charge is basically anything to do with wireless. Is you know if it if it falls out of the ordinary, if it's advanced troubleshooting, if it's questions of you know, can this department do such and such without, you know, stepping on other people? All of those come to me. Um, so a typical day in my policy life, a lot of our uh, policies I have either written or signific significantly contributed to. Um, and then they were blessed by a team of um, executives who agreed with it and, you know, kind of made sure that they were harmonized with the rest of our policies. The notion of rogue removal and problematic neighbor issues, you know, some of that is just typical um, system admin stuff. Um, but again, kind of falls under me. One of my favorite uh, roles is the, we've gotten to a point where thankfully uh, most people who want to do something wireless know that they're better off uh, running it by me and our group to make sure it's going to fit in the environment and not cause problems. And that is actually one of our policy statements. You know, we really should, <laughs> we really need to evaluate all of the crazy stuff that's out there for everybody's benefit. And some of that is to keep the end users from basically wasting money on something that couldn't work in our environment, no matter how many hoops you jump through. Um, and then you can see the others, PCI, I think I covered that one already, the fact that we have bookstores and all of that, and the notion of exceptions, um, you know, we're a big complicated place, and um, we can't just be the no store for everything, so, you know, there is an exception uh, process, it's not always easy or not always satisfying, but um, I'd say 80% of the time we figure out how to do uh, what needs to be done to everybody's satisfaction. And the balance is just kind of, you know, stuff that, you know, just wouldn't be at home on any uh, wireless network anywhere for any reason. And then going with that is also, you know, client education. That's just a constant, you know, um, that just doesn't go away. And with that, as I look at the clock, I think that gives us a few minutes for uh, Q&A and um, hopefully we've provoked at least a little bit of thought. Yeah, sure does, Lee, thanks a lot. Uh, I really enjoyed that. I just wanna uh, reiterate what you said about getting executive buy-in and how important that is. It really, you know, when those challenges to security best practices, not even policy necessarily show up, that really changes the way those things are handled. Instead of becoming anta antagonistic between you, the wireless guy, and whoever it is that wants to do something that's maybe not a good idea, it's, okay, here's our policy, and we've got, you know, this is aligned with the, the vision and mission of our company as management has, uh, has uh, so elaborated on and and uh, you know that just makes it a better conversation gives it probably a better chance that you'll end up with better wireless security in general that way so 
really important point point there. Uh, a couple good questions from the audience. We appreciate everybody hanging on uh, with us today. Lee, I got a good question here from uh, Olivier. He says, what's the number one clause in your higher education security policy that users violate? Mm. Is there a most common violation? Uh, it's going to be a couple of them and it's really indicative of, uh, they go together and it's just kind of indicative of the uh, times that we live in. So we have forced password changes every, I think it's annual, whatever, it doesn't matter what the interval is, but the users get bombarded with, you know, change your password, your password's gonna expire, change your password. Uh, password is important to so many things on the network, including wireless with 802.1x, um, and they don't change it. So, you know, again, that's written in a policy statement somewhere, and, you know, we have systems that enforce it. That's not wireless specific, but it touches wireless, and then when it goes off the rails because they just absolutely refuse to do the password thing, um, their 802.1x access stops working. And what comes next? Whip out the hotspot. And if you get too many people doing that at the same time, you know, we ask that you please don't do hotspots in auditoriums and don't do hotspots in <laughs> where we have our dense wireless environment because some hotspots are doing 80 megahertz wide channels and get two or three of them in an auditorium. And because two or three people out of 800 decided that they were gonna ignore the password warnings and um, you got problems. So if I were to zoom that out a little bit, you know, the password thing um, leads to the deployment of hotspots, but also the, uh, you know, putting in any darn thing you want and violating that part of it. And that's just not, that's not just students. That's, you know, faculty and researchers on occasion. And, you know, you can always tell what, if they're sincere when they're giving you the, I didn't know, especially if you're a, especially if you're a dad and you've got kids, <laughs> you could start to read the, uh, yeah, sure you didn't. <laughs> but, but, you know, absolutely the self-installed uh, stuff is our biggest problem. When I say it's our biggest problem, it's still not that big of a problem for us. Thankfully, we've done a fairly good job articulating it, but it comes up enough where um, it is something that we have to deal with. Sounds good. And uh, maybe one last question here from Peter. Um, interesting question. He says, any thoughts on what to do if you develop a security policy and you are unable to get senior management support? Um, I guess I would say, um, you know, part of part of the getting of that support is the story of, and here's what happens if you don't buy in. Th this is what we're going to be living with. Um, you know, not drama, but pure facts of, you know, this is what policy says, if this gets violated, this is what's going to happen. And just be honest about, you know, audits are going to rip us up on this. And, um, you know, we're going to be in regulatory non-compliance here. And, you know, and the wireless is just going to suck. You know, just get all of that out there. And if somebody won't buy in, sometimes it takes a crisis to get that buy-in, but at least have it documented that you tried, you know, this is what I said is gonna happen on such and such date. I gave you the all of this and now that it's come to fruition, you know, you're not gonna you're not gonna bend this on me kind of stuff. But you know, just a well reasoned um you know, well reasoned uh scenario of what happens if they don't help you with the policy. Yeah, and one thing I would add is there's somebody in management, you know, maybe there's not a CISO, or maybe there's not even a CTO, maybe there's a COO, somebody's got responsibility for information security. And, you know, their job's on the line when things go wrong and, and, and a, 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 a appropriate policy is just as much in their interest as it is um, in, in 
yours. So, you know, find the right person there to talk to and help them uh, understand the, the urgency.